ವಂದೇಹಂ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರು ಶ್ರೀಯುತಪದಕಮಲ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುನ್ ವೈಷ್ಣವಾಂಶ್ಚ ಶ್ರೀರೂಪ ಸಾಗ್ರಜಾತ ಸಹ ಗಣರಘುನಾಥಾನ್ವಿತ ತಂ ಸಜೀವ ಸಾಧ್ವೈತ ಸಾವಧೂತ ಪರಿಜನ ಸಹಿತ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯದೇವ ಶ್ರೀರಾಧಾಕೃಷ್ಣಪಾದ ಸಹ ಗಣಲಿತ ಶ್ರೀ ವಿಶಾಖಾನ್ವಿತ ನಮ ಓಂ ವಿಷ್ಣುಪಾದ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪ್ರೇಷ್ಠಾಯ ಭೂತಲೆ ಶ್ರೀಮತೆ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವೇದಾಂತ ಸ್ವಾಮಿನ್ನಿತಿ ನಾಮಿನೆ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಸಾರಸ್ವತೆ ದೇವೇ ಗೌರವಾಣಿ ಪ್ರಚಾರಣೆ ನಿರ್ವಿಶೇಷ ಶೂನ್ಯವಾದಿ ಪಾಶ್ಚಾತ್ಯ ದೇಶತಾರಣೆ ವಾಂಛಾಕಲ್ಪತರೂಭ್ಯ ಕೃಪಾ ಸಿಂಧುಭ್ಯ ಪತಿ ಪಾವನೆಭ್ಯೋ ವೈಷ್ಣವೇಭ್ಯೋ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭೂ ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗದಾಧರ ಶ್ರೀವಾಸಾದಿಗೌರಭಕ್ತವೃಂದ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೇ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಸೊ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ನಾವು ರೀಚ್ಡ್ ಓಲ್ಡ್ ಏಜ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅವರ್ ಬಾಡೀಸ್ ಆರ್ ಪೇನಿಂಗ್ ಏಕಿಂಗ್ and we are thinking very deeply about life many times we become so anxious when the body is racked with pain it is very hard to think of krishna when we are in deep pain there is the time when we take a lot of medication it's natural at the same time we have to remember krishna we may take medicines or we may not take medicines we may be in good health or in poor health but we should train ourselves to remembering krishna all the time as much as we can by engaging in various acts of devotional service king kulu shekhar the great devotee <coughs> alwar he has prayed idam shariram shatasandhi jarjaram patatyavashyam parinam apeshalam kim aushadhim prichhase mood duramate niramayam krishna rasayanam piba the meaning is he is saying idam shariram this body shatasandhi jarjaram it's full of these joints that are always aching and very difficult to sit and those of you who have joint pains occasionally or frequently you know how difficult it can be and especially if you're over 60 or 65 and the joints are paining arthritis or something like that so this body is like that idam shariram shatasandhi jarjaram is full of these joints that are very painful that are stiff and aching patatyavashyam and destruction of this body is guaranteed parinam apeshalam the beauty is also fleeting in such a such, such a situation kim aushadhim prichhasi why are you asking for medicines mood durmate it's a very harsh language king kulshekar uses sometimes devotees use very strong language not that we should imitate them but great devotees they may sometimes have to use their harsh language to wake us up from the slumber of illusion as bhakti vinod thakur said in the song that we sung in the morning today kato nidra jao maya pishachi rakhole that we are sleeping on the lap of the witch called maya so sometimes great devotees use very harsh words to wake us up from that illusion so he says o mudha o foolish person o durmati o one whose intelligence has got spoiled why are you simply repeatedly asking for medicine 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 niramayam krishna rasayanam piba if you want to be really happy 
you should drink the elixir or the ambrosial nectar the drink of krishna krishna rasayanam in ayurveda you have what's called a rasayanam which is like a tonic so king kulu shekar advises all of us this material body especially in old age will only give problems so rather than all the time being conscious of the aches and pains in the body rather than being in bodily consciousness all the time you take the krishna rasayanam chant krishna's names hear about krishna read krishna's literature serve krishna and that is a niramayam it's a prophylactic that it, it will prevent further illness and the greatest illness that can be prevented by the krishna rasayanam is the disease of bhava it's called bhava rog bhava rog means that disease which causes us to be repeatedly born and die so by far this is the most deadly disease you may have tb cholera so many other dangerous diseases in this world but nothing to beat the disease called bhava rog forgetfulness of krishna which makes you rotate in the cycle of birth and death again and again so prophylactic is that which prevents you from getting sick so if you take krishna rasayana then not only will you be able to bear your painful situation very nicely your mind will not get so much disturbed in that old age or in the diseased state or in any state of mental calamity or discomfort one will be protected so this instruction from king kulu shekhar is very important for us and we shouldn't wait till old age as we were discussing another argument that people give for delaying spiritual life to old age is that unless you have enjoyed this world and experienced everything the world has to offer how can you renounce or be detached in the old age therefore you should actually lead a life of enjoyment in the beginning then when you have experienced something and realize that it is futile it is hollow it is simply pain and not happiness then you will spontaneously give it up this kind of argument was given by daksha son of brahma to Na- to narad muni because daksha had sons 10000 sons and he sent them to do austerity so that they could come back in a fit condition to be princes in the kingdom they happened to meet narad muni and whoever meets narad muni becomes a brahmachari so then the narad muni said what are you doing in worldly life like this you come on come leave everything so then they all became brahmacharis so daksha was very unhappy but he didn't say anything then he had thousand sons more then when they grew up he sent them also to uh, perform austerities as a preparation for coming back and taking responsibility and they also happened to meet narad muni they also became brahmacharis and this time daksha became very angry and he cursed narad muni he said i curse you that you will never be able to stay in one place for one time for for a long time and narad muni was very thankful for that he said okay very good so i'll keep wandering chanting and glorifying krishna everywhere so in the course of that discussion daksha happened to mention to narad muni that your idea that these young people should become renounced is false <clears throat> because unless they have experienced the enjoyment of this world how will they realize that this enjoyment is not real happiness once they have had the experience then they will be able to be detached they should do it in old age not now and shri prabhupad gives very extensive comments there and he explains that actually experience of this world or experience of sense enjoyment doesn't necessarily 
give us a sense of detachment. In as much as pouring oil or ghee into the fire doesn't extinguish the fire, rather it makes the fire blaze even more fiercely. So more and more indulgence in sense gratification will not remove or diminish the desire for sense gratification, rather it will increase it. So therefore the idea that we must enjoy and then we will after experience detach is not something that is borne out by practical experience also. So in this way people keep postponing, postponing and eventually we die, we come to the point of death, even then we postpone and it's too late after that. How many of you have heard the story of Kailash? The man called Kailash who met Narad Muni. No? Very interesting story. Narad Muni came to this man called Kailash. And he said, Kailash, let us do and go and do Krishna consciousness. Let us perform devotional service to Krishna. This is the goal of human life. Kailash was a young man at that time. So he said, Yes, I definitely want to come, O Narad Muni. But the point is that I am a young man and I have just got married. Therefore, I have to settle down in my life and then I will come. Then Narad Muni came after some time. He said, Kailash, I am here now. Let us do devotional service. He said, well, Narad Muni, what you are saying is completely right. But you see, now my children are young and they need me by their side. I can't just give them up like this and go. But after some time, I'll be ready to come with you. After a few years, Narad Muni came back. Kailash, I have come. So come on, let's go for doing some devotional service. So the man Kailash replied, Well, you see, now my children are grown up and I have to get them married. So that's a big responsibility of parents. So once I get them married, then I will come with you. After they were married, Narad Muni came. Kailash, let us go and perform devotional service. Kailash said, Oh, Narad Muni, I really want to come. But you see, now I have small grandchildren and who's going to look after them? And my children, they're just not mature enough to know how to handle these things. So I have to be there to train them so that they are properly set. Once they are settled, then I will come. In this way, Kailash kept on postponing it. And then one day Narad Muni came back and he asked, he couldn't see Kailash. He said, where is Kailash? And they said, oh, he died last week. So that was the end of the story. What is the moral? Who is Kailash actually? Everybody, that's right. We are all the Kailashes. We are postponing, postponing, postponing. Young childhood, no, no, we are too young, we will do it later. Now it's time to play. The young people, no, now I have studies, I have to do this, so many things. Then you grow up, now I have a job, a career to take, take, take care of, and there's such pressure in the workplace. And as we go on, well, now I have so many family responsibilities, where is the time to do Krishna consciousness? And old age, well, I have to go to hospital for this and the God doctor for that. And then time passes, the cycle of human life comes to an end and a new cycle begins. It goes on and on and on. One time His Holiness Chandra Moli Maharaj was just saying that he spoke this story in one particular lecture. And after that one gentleman came to see him and he told him, Swamiji, I have something to tell you. He said, yes, tell me. My name is Kailash. <laughs> so he was very worried. He said, no, 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 I wasn't speaking about you. It's a general story. So this is the story of the cycle of life. That's all we do, round and round and round. One big zero. Birth, death, old age, disease. Birth, death, old age, disease. Going round and round and round. Punarapi jananam, punarapi maranam, punarapi janani, jathare shayanam. So one has to be so responsible and so intelligent and careful. 
we have to understand the the up that death is around the corner once shri prabhupad was in america and some journalist asked him a question swami swami ji in india there is such a high mortality rate because of this disease that disease there is cholera there is tb a very high mortality rate so prabhupad said the mortality rate mortality rate is exactly the same everywhere what is that 100% because everybody has to die so mortality rate is exactly 100% everywhere nowhere is it less than 100% so then now as we get old and we move on and we are facing death and at that time we have to prepare ourselves mentally physically we shouldn't try to simply evade death rather we should bravely and in krishna consciousness fearlessly face it generally people tend to evade and avoid it as much as possible of course that is a natural instinct so one may try, if, if you are going it doesn't mean that to be fearless means that you don't take precautions we should not be foolish we should not unnecessarily invite death or difficulty but when it comes of its own accord beyond over and above our reasonable attempts to check it then we have to surrender and remember krishna that is the mentality of a person who is about to face death there is a humorous story i remember hearing about this one man who was a sculptor by profession and he knew that his death was coming because he he knew and as he knew astrology very well also so he calculated his own horoscopes and everything and understood that the exact time the date and time at which he would be dying so he knew that yamaraj would come with his yamadutas to take him to take his soul away so then he thought of a trick he said let me try to cheat yamaraj and deceive him so that he won't be able to get me when he comes here so he was a sculptor so he made images of himself many many images 20 30 images of himself statues that looked exactly like him and all in one pose that thinking pose you know that famous pose the person sitting like this so there are 25 or 30 such sculptures all exactly looking like him and all in that pose so he also sat in that pose at that moment when yamaraj was expected so yamaraj came riding on his vehicle the buffalo and he looked he said oh my god what is this now which one is the real one to pick out he wasn't able to make out which is a sculpture sc- sculpture who is the real man so at the same time he has to do his duty he has to take away the soul of that person to yamaloka then he thought ah so this person is trying to be clever but yamaraj is more clever yamaraj understands human psychology so yamaraj said aloud oh what a horrible sculptor this is he doesn't know anything about sculpture just see each of these sculptures is so badly done now as he went on and on and this sculptor couldn't take it he said what do you mean and there okay here you are catch come on <laughs> nobody likes to be criticized right so when you are criticized then you protest so even if he wanted to he should have kept quiet but his his human nature didn't allow him so yamaraj cut him and took him away so anyway nobody can evade death death comes and the whole life goes away like that prahlad maharaj in the shrimad bhagavatam says out of an average of 100 years lifetime which was at the beginning of kali yuga one spends 50 years sleeping then one spends the first 10 years in play as a child then the next 10 years goes in studying and doing various other things in in youth and then the last 20 years of life 
simply goes in trying to avoid suffering, in dealing with bad health and dealing with the failing body. So that's 50 plus 20 plus 10 plus 10, that's 90. That remains only 10 years. 10 years of life remaining in middle age in which one is so absorbed in family maintenance and sensual enjoyment, where is the time for Krishna? So Prahlad laments, so 100 years of life, the whole human cycle gone. Wasted, gone with the wind. And this is happening not now, it has happened for millions and millions of lives. When we face death, what is it that happens? The Upanishads, the Puranas, even the Vedanta Sutra gives information about what happens at the time of death. There are very detailed descriptions which we won't get into. But suffice it to say, that at death, generally, if one is not killed all of a sudden, then the senses of the body, they start slowly withdrawing. And they st therefore the extremities start getting cold, the fingers, the hands, the toes. As the senses and the life airs start withdrawing, withdrawing, and then the body starts the senses, they start vibrating and attempting to move out of the body. The body starts creaking and rattling like an old chariot. Imagine an old chariot that's rattling and creaking, so the body makes sounds like that. The mucus comes up, the, the nose, the mouth, and the different senses of the body become very disturbed. In that painful condition, the, the pain may be like the biting of many, many scorpions. In some places it is mentioned, thousands of scorpions biting at one time. So that is the time now when the body is unfit for the soul to reside within. And the soul also wants to leave now. And then the super soul shows the way. The subtle body carries the soul, the life airs carry the soul, and now the soul has to leave the body. How does the soul leave the body? It leaves the body through the different apertures in the body. How many apertures are there in the body? Nine. So this body is called a city of nine gates. Navadvara Pura. In the story of King Puranjan in the Srimad Bhagavatam, this is explained in great detail. So what are the nine apertures in the body? We have the mouth, we have the two eyes, we have the two nostrils, we have the two ears, we have the anus and we have the genitals. So we have nine such apertures in the body. And actually there is also a tenth one. But the tenth one is a very, very small aperture. And that is on the top of the head. And that is called the Brahma Randra. But that is usually closed. It doesn't open up except for one who is very spiritually evolved. So then, when the time comes for the soul to leave the body, it has to leave through one of these apertures. So the sinful living entities, for them, the soul, the human beings that is, the soul will leave through the lower apertures. For those who are pious human beings, the soul leaves through the higher apertures. Maybe the mouths, maybe the eyes. And for those who are spiritually perfected yogis, the Brahma Randra on the top of the head opens up and the soul leaves through the top of the head. How many of you have seen this book called Easy Journey to Other Planets by Srila Prabhupada? At least when I read it, I remember, now unless BBT has changed the cover, there was a picture of a yogi sitting in meditation and then a light coming out of the top of his head. Do you remember that picture? So that's exactly this, the soul living through the aperture that's on the top of the head, the Brahma Randra, and it goes away. So in this way, the soul will be forced to depart and after some time the soul cannot bear to be there. So the soul also wants to leave. Sometimes when the soul doesn't want to leave 
and there's a struggle going on that's a stage of coma you know what a comatose condition is and they may remain like this for a long time so soul is struggling there's a battle going on inside and the soul doesn't want to go but in many cases the soul wants to go because it is too much to bear there are many people who have what are called near death experiences have you heard this phrase and many times they go to different realms they they have these experiences and many of them they see going through a tunnel with a light at the end of it and sometimes they go to some other realm where they meet different types of people <coughs> and then sometimes they brought back otherwise they wouldn't have a near death experience it would be a death experience <laughs> near death is only when they come back from that experience right that's why they live to tell their experience otherwise we don't know and somehow the other for some reason maybe it was a wrong number or whatever it is they go and they come back i remember i met one gentleman who wasn't a devotee but his wife was a devotee and he had some major heart ailment and uh, he was in hospital for many days uh, he wasn't a devotee he would allow his wife to do devotional service but he said don't make me do anything i won't get involved in your krishna consciousness so then after his illness his wife requested me to come and meet him so i went to their house and i sat with him for some time and then he said i was waiting for you to come because i had something very interesting to tell you of an experience <coughs> of an experience i had so i said yes what happened he said when i was in the surgery when they were operating me actually i went through this tunnel and then i saw this light and then i went past and i came to another i that it was long and i went travel and traveled i was looking at the world everything was looking so beautiful and then suddenly after a while i came to some place which was extraordinarily beautiful and there was lush green beautiful fields and flowers and then there were all sorts of huge palatial buildings that were extremely uh, well constructed looked like palaces and there were various types of people floating in and out some of them were wearing uh, golden helmets and they were all shining and effulgent golden complexioned they were all very very beautiful some men some ladies they were not even walking properly they were like floating as if they were in dancing or something and then as i was entering the one person came up to me and said you are not supposed to be here and then i came back so there are many experiences of this sort on which you'll find books now sometimes you don't know who is making up what in some cases they may be hallucinations and in some cases they may not be hallucinations and how does one explain these tunnels and this light at the other end and so on that is actually the soul trying to leave the body it is a super soul under whose uh, superintendence all this is taking place karmana daiva netrena <coughs> so the super soul has to decide okay now the time is is this is the time to leave the body and the super soul also decides which aperture the soul will leave from the higher or the lower apertures and then the super soul illuminates that particular channel and only that channel so the other channels are dark so the soul can only see that channel so the soul naturally moves towards that and because of the light produced by the super soul there is a light at the end of the tunnel and then he moves on to some destination now whether in some cases they they go like that to some place where they go if it's sometimes a mistakes there are examples of some mistakes we have the case of ajamil where the yamadutas came to get him and then the vishnu dutas came so then the 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 soul leaves the body and goes away where will the uh, a soul go in the subtle body 
they will the soul will be taken to the destination where it is meant to go on by virtue of its karma and that decision is taken by yamaraj so <coughs> if he is a very sinful living entity a human being has performed many many sins then most likely he'll go through the, he'll exit the body through the lower apertures and then the yamadutas come for such a soul for such a person the yamadutas are very fierce looking and this is not some mythology they actually come and many people in their last days the last moments they actually see the yamadutas and it frightens them no end many of them die of fright at that time it's not because of the old age of this death is coming anyway but they get so frightened that they die out of fright in those last few moments some of them may not die out of fright but they may still manage but they're terrified there was the an article i read in back to godhead magazine i remember many many years ago in which there was a story of one gentleman in america whose son had become a hari krishna devotee the son was a painter and he had painted many of these pictures and he was, he had also painted the painting of ajamil and the yamadutas and naturally he had shown it to his parents his father was a kshatriya kind of a man he, he didn't want to believe in anything saying this is all bogus i don't believe in this so in any case when it came to his last moments he started shouting to his wife bring me my gun bring me my gun so she was wondering what happened why do you want your gun what happened you know bring me the gun i want to get them so whom do you want to get he said they have come to get me who has come to get you well those people see in peter's books those drawings there those people have come to get me and he was describing them and it was exactly as was described or shown in those pictures and described in the shrimad bhagavatam and then after a while he died so this is not something that is an imagination <coughs> it does happen to those who are very who have led sinful lives then the i remember also another devotee mentioning uh, he described this in one class his own experience that he was in a private room that was shared between him and another patient so his was quite a serious illness <coughs> and the next door patient was also very serious but this devotee wasn't that serious he was in the phase of recovery so then as he was sitting leaning his back against the the end of the bed he was shocked to see two personalities coming in through the wall not through the door he came in through the wall two of them because for them the wall is not a barrier at all so the yamadutas they were yamadutas he recognized them because he understood what the yamadutas were so these yamadutas came and he was terrified thing i am a devotee how can they come for me so he was looking on and the yamadutas moved but they came by but they didn't look at this devotee they went by to the next bed so the devotee was just petrified looking on and then they moved to the other side and he couldn't see them in a few moments there was some alarms going on some instruments there pom 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 something went off and the nurse came running in and they started doing things and then and eventually after a few minutes they declare that he had died so therefore this yamadutha business is real thing it happens but it happens for those who are sinful then the yamadutas actually pull out the soul the subtle body from the body from the gross body wrap it and put it in a bag not your usual shopping bag and then they carry back to yamaloka where yamaraj is sitting all this is described in the garud purana and the way to yamaloka is very tortuous very difficult they have to go through they is forced to walk on a hot sandy path the feet burn this burning sun overhead and so on you know for in karmakanda 
Of course, devotees, for us, it's not so important. But in Karma Kanda, usually when they do a Shraddha ceremony, then uh, the Brahmin will ask the family members to donate certain things to uh, the Brahmanas, right? What are the thing they ask to donate? Umbrella, shoes, and so on. Why? Shoes, because they're special shoes, then when he is walking to Yamaloka, <laughs> he will not be troubled by the hot sands beneath. You get a special kind of body that goes there. And over the head you'll get an umbrella, at least you'll be shielded from that kind of misery. And then you are taken to Yamaloka, so that may take a while by earthly standards. <clears throat> Actually, once the soul leaves the body, it moves around the gross body for a while. And it takes roughly 11 or 12 days for the subtle body to get another body, which is subtler than the gross body, but grosser than the subtle body. It's a special body that is awarded to make that journey from there to Yamaloka. So that is why the Shraddha ceremony the, eventually takes place on the 11th, 12th day. For those days, everyone does chanting. You're not supposed to mourn. You're not supposed to cry. Because the more you cry near the departed soul, near the person who has died, that soul will find it more difficult to leave the body and to go to the next destination. We'll be stuck over there. So therefore what is recommended is to do a lot of recitation of the scriptures and chanting of the holy names. So that will help the, on, the, the departed soul in its onward movement. And also the, the relatives and the friends, uh, it will help them to be relieved of grief, of separation from their loved one. So then after the twelfth day, it's called a preta. And then is moved on. Of course, if somebody has a very violent death like um, suicide or something, then they get a ghostly body. And after that term is over, then once again they have to go to Yamaloka. Then the judgment takes place. And then if they're very, very sinful, then they have to go to hell the hellish planets, which are situated at the bottom of the universe. In the fifth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, it is explained that there are 28 types of hellish planets. And depending on what kinds of sinful activities we have performed, then one has to go to that particular hell, get the punishment for that sin, then go to the other one, get for the other sins, and so on and so forth. And even for that punishment, one has to accept a suitable body, which is an airy body, which is unbreakable, so that one can suffer through that type of body, the sinful reactions for all the sins that we have committed on earth. And then after most of that is exhausted, not everything, then one comes to the lower species of life, as we discussed yesterday morning, the 8.4 million, then usually we'll start from the bottom and go all the way up, 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 up. So the sinful reactions have not been fully exhausted. Just a vast majority of the sins are exhausted in hell. And then a lot of it is exhausted as we go through the lower species. And something is still left when we come to the human form of life. The spillover from the previous <laughs> human life. That's why sometimes the, the sinful reactions may be very strong. So then one comes to human form of life and again the whole cycle starts. If the living entity, the human has not been very sinful, then uh, the soul will leave, go to Yamaloka and then come back to earthly life or maybe bypass hell and go to the lower species and then come to the human species. Or, or the living entity, if he's pious, he leaves through the higher apertures, may go to Swargaloka or some of the higher planets. And as we discussed earlier, then after that piety is exhausted, then they fall back to earth again. Generally, the period may be anything from a few weeks to a few years. 
sometimes even longer than a few years. The gap, sometimes people ask how long will it take to get the next birth. Can't say, it depends. In some cases it may be very soon, in some cases it may take time. And of course ultimately for uh, the perfected soul, the soul leaves the body through the Brahmarandra and goes to the spiritual world. And that is of course what we want to do. That is where we want to be. We don't want to be anywhere else. So this is the story ultimately of how the living entity moves after death, goes to the different dimensions of life in the universe according to its karma, comes back. So this cycle goes on and on and on. We won't go too much into detail, there are many technical details about every little thing that I have mentioned, but this much is sufficient for now. So this is a big science and there are certain, when you go to the higher planets, the soul, there are certain heavenly beings that come to escort the, the subtle body or the soul to the higher planet. Just as there are Yamadutas who come to take to Yamaloka, there are also special kinds of living beings who come to take the soul up to the next body. And all this is going on under the superintendence of the super soul, who is present in the heart. So the cycle goes on. So once we have, meanwhile, the Shraddha ceremony is performed, the final sanskaras, even after the person has died, his descendants will perform Shraddha. For many generations, Shraddha comes from the word Shraddha, which means faith. So that has to be performed with faith. One offers oblations like fire, into the fire, like um, rice balls and so on and so forth. Water, when you offer water, it is called Tarpan. When you offer the rice balls, it's called pind. And then that offering is done in the Shraddha so that the benefits of that will reach the departed ancestor, wherever that ancestor may be, in whatever form, on whatever planet. It doesn't matter. <coughs> the question may be asked, how is that possible? One time there was this little thing I remember reading from my childhood, the little story of this one person who is considered a, is considered a saint by many people in India. But <clears throat> when you actually study his teachings, you see he spoke very much against Vedic culture and Vedic principles. Of course, no need to mention names. He was very much also against deity worship. And he would say that if one can get God by worshipping a stone, then I'll worship the mountain. To some degree he's right, because we shouldn't be just whimsically and sentimentally, ignorantly worshipping anything and everything is God. Some people do like that. So in that sense what he's saying is right. However, with a blanket statement, he's ruling out even the bona fide deities of the Lord. And also, if he has to worship a mountain, why not Govardhan? Yes, all right, worship a mountain, but worship Govardhan. Anyway, so for this, this particular saint, a saintly person, he one time was pouring, he was pouring water just outside his door, the door of his house. And his neighbor was watching curiously and came and asked, what are you doing here? What are you pouring water here? He said, I'm pouring water on my crops. So your crops, yes, my crops which I have tilled, but your crops are over there, one kilometer away in your field. So why are you pouring here? So he said, my ancestors have departed and gone, and I am offering rice balls and water here. So he wanted to make a point. That is illogical. This whole Shraddha principle is illogical. So he was trying to make a point in a dramatic way. If your 
offerings and oblations can reach your forefathers who are in a different place why can my water not reach my crops of course the water can't reach the crops there but the mechanism by which the oblations or the offerings to the ancestors reach the ancestors is different it takes place on a different dimension it is still material but very subtle in the shrimad bhagavatam also it is explained that the different kinds of uh, fire gods and and personalities residents of the heavenly planets whose service it is to take the offerings that have been given by the descendants in a form that can be transported in a subtle form and it reaches the ancestors wherever they are whatever form and it will reach them in a form that they can assimilate for example if it's in a cow the cow may get some grass the cow may get water to drink in a human body maybe we may get some good food or if we are in hell then one may be relieved from the sufferings of hell punnam narakat prayate iti putra so the putra the son is one who delivers the forefathers from the hell named pu by shraddha so in case the forefathers are in hell for some sinful uh, actions they performed then they will be liberated by the performance of shraddha so these are very subtle things that are going on within the universe but mind you it's not spiritual it's still on the material platform even though it's very subtle so we get the benefits but that as i said is karma kanda nowadays people are not even doing that if one is not a devotee then at least one should do that but people are neither devotees nor do they want to do anything like this in karma kanda so the the departed souls have no solace they suffer everywhere in different stations of life all over the universe in different species sometimes even in ghostly species as far as devotees are concerned it doesn't really matter so much a devotee is not dependent upon the descendants to deliver him or her so a devotee is delivered by strength of the mercy of the lord and the devotees when the devotee performs sincere and pure devotional service so as devotees we are not very concerned whether somebody will do shraddha for us or not after we die so you can rest assured don't have to worry about that but should a grihastha do should a devotee do shraddha for departed forefathers generally for grihasthas it may be the norm advaita acharya also did that however even in that condition we should krishnaize the ceremony rather than making it a karma kanda ceremony shrila prabhupada explained that a first class shraddha is that in which the devotees of krishna are invited there is prasadam distribution there is chanting of the holy names some krishna katha and that's the first class shraddha and this krishna prasadam is offered to the departed ancestors so this will give them transcendental benefit this to some degree the grihasthas may do but we do not need to go through the karma kanda process and by becoming a devotee pralad says in the shrimad bhagavatam actually that one delivers seven generations of one's ancestors and descendants even and that happens in three previous three lives this life the life before that the life before that so 21 generations can be delivered by a devotee delivered from sinful reaction delivered from the hellish planets but of course the descendants uh, do have to struggle and do their sadhana to come to devotional service and go back to god it so this is the journey of the uh, soul after death at death of course it's a very painful experience 
sometimes the memory gets spoiled we cannot think of anything therefore king kulushekar again has prayed krishna tvadeya pada pankaja panjarantam adhyayiva me vishatu manasa rajaham sah prana prayana samaye kafavat pittaihi kanthavarodhana vidhau smaranam kutaste he says my dear lord let the the uh, lotus let the swan of my mind raja hamsa be always absorbed in the stems of your lotus feet just as a, a a swan sometimes goes and puts its beak and gets entangled in the network of the stems of the lotus flowers in a pond they're giving a very picturesque analogy king kulashekar plays that let my mind which is like a swan be entangled in the stems of the lotus of your lotus feet and let me leave my body at this time let me pass away from this world now when i am able to remember you i when i am in a hale and hearty condition my senses are in order and it is possible for me to think of you properly and clearly because at the time of death kantha avarodhana vidho the the throat will be full kapha vata pittaihi with bile mucus and air and at that time will be body will be racked with pain then how can one think of you at that time so better take me away now for a devotee of krishna of course if the intensity of devotion is very strong then the remembrance can go on despite the pain also being intense the devotee will not be disturbed sometimes the devotees may need help in some situations of terminal illness where many devotees have cancer and so on this happens in um, in vrindavan we have a hospice which is especially meant for those in terminal stages of life who are about to leave the body any time so then it's a very krishna conscious atmosphere where devotees will come and chant next to you read to you for weeks and weeks together there are certain criteria they have that you have to be at a certain stage of a terminal illness before you are accepted there so the question arises often that in those cases not in other cases but in certain cases because the pain is intense they need to give painkillers so now the painkillers may interfere with the consciousness so should we give painkillers to the patients there or not tricky question the answer is of course that if the pain is too excruciating to the degree that one cannot think of anything except the pain then some painkiller must be given so that at least the the devotee will be able to focus on something apart from the pain he can focus on krishna despite some pain being there still but in order to reduce the pain if you pump in so much of um sedatives or whatever other forms of painkillers there are to the degree that the person becomes completely numb and unconscious and what's the use if you can't think of krishna like that so there has to be some intermediate um degree of medication that has to be given so that the person can still think of krishna even though there is some pain so this is the situation we begin from the previous life we go in all the way through the womb childhood youth middle age old age at the time of death can we remember krishna at the time of death we saw examples in each case in the womb is dhruva is is uh, prahlad and parikshit childhood dhruva youth bharat maharaj and maharaj ambarish in old age dhritarashtra at the time of death there are two examples ajamil and 
very small episode in the bhagavatam very brief mention king khatvanga king khatvanga was a brave warrior a brave king and he was called to fight on behalf of the demigods he fought for many many years and then the time came for him to uh, come back to the earth the demigods were very pleased with him so they asked him what benediction would you like from us and he wanted to make sure now that uh, they wouldn't call him any more so he asked them please tell me how much time i have left to live and the demigod said you have only one moment left to live so what did uh, king khatvanga do did he protest no no how can that be no immediately he sat down to focus his mind on krishna at the very moment of death and then he concentrated his mind in krishna consciousness and then he departed from this world and the case of ajamil of course is the famous one where ajamil having lived a sinful life for many years fortunately by virtue of his samskaras earlier in his life given by his parents he named his youngest son narayan at which time ajamil was about 80 years of age and at that time he saw the yamadutas coming and he was terrified and he couldn't say anything he was speechless he was too terrified to speak no words would come and all of a sudden the vishnu dutas came and in a loud voice they held up their hands and forbade the yamadutas from taking away ajamila's soul he said don't do that you cannot do that so the yamadutas asked the vishnu dutas who are you my dear sirs we have never before seen you you look very noble and cultured and so on but we have not seen you and neither has anybody to date obstructed us in the performance of our duty this man is most sinful so we are taking him away so the vishnu dutas explained who they were so we are vishnu dutas and you have made a big mistake by take trying to take away the soul of this man but then he has committed so many sinful activities and then the vishnu duta said but he has chanted the name of narayan at the time of his death so therefore you he is beyond your jurisdiction now anybody who chants even one name of the lord cannot be touched by you so there was a debate that happened right there and then imagine ajamil is about to die and his fate is hanging in balance of what happens between in this discussion who will win and he's watching on okay here what are they saying what are they saying he is lying in his bed completely dumbstruck not in a position to say anything finally the vishnu dutas of course emerge victorious and the yama dutas go back and they are perplexed they go to yamaraj and said we thought that you were the supreme now we hear that the, what what's going on here who are these vishnu dutas so yamaraj smiled and then explained that uh, No I am not the ultimate I have a super someone superior to me is the supreme lord Krishna and hence for anyway you made a mistake you should not go to the person who is chanting Krishna's names you should be away from him and so on this side Ajamil who was on the point of death he got a reprieve and the Vishnu dutas went back Yamadutha has also went back and Ajamil lived for 12 years more immediately he left for Haridwar and there he engaged in devotional service and at the end of 12 years he perfected his life and went back to godhead so there are many examples like this of how uh, great devotees went back to godhead and in many cases some who were very sinful who eventually got rectified and then they also perfected their life so in this cycle of things there are six phases of transformation dust to dust 
there is birth there is growth there is maturity there is production of by products there is decay and there is destruction or death so these six stages are there which are the six stages birth growth maturity by products decaying death so all living entities go through this phase whether it's an animal or a bird or a germ or a tree or demigod or a human being so we we are all this body from dust to dust yes it came from dust the body so we were born then we grow we reach a point of maturity then we have children then we grow old and then we die so this is the cycle that goes on and on and this has been going on from time immemorial now this human form of life is a golden gift for us to stop this repetition of 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 birth and death this ferris wheel round and round and round and round in 8.4 million species of life so we have to destroy this dust to dust syndrome become pure devotees of krishna and go home back to godhead hare krishna it's quite a heavy dose hey amandutas and ghosts and so i won't give an overdose okay so i'm leaving quite a bit of time for questions and at the end we'll also have a little kirtan so now you can ask questions on whatever we have discussed today or yesterday but please ask questions that are only pertinent to the discussion we have had only on these topics and make your questions clear and to the point yes yes hari krishna maharaj uh you explain that the soul after death maybe you if, can keep it at a little distance yeah, yeah. so if the um the body has got the if the human being has committed sinful activities then the soul is taken by yamadutas to um to the hellish planets what happens to the super soul then does it travel along with the yamadutas the super soul is always with the soul so long as the soul is within the material world the super soul never leaves the side of the soul that is why the super soul is the best friend who never gives up the company of the soul in life we find so many people who will give up our company when some unfavorable situation comes up mm-hmm. but krishna's friendship with the soul is affection for the soul his mercy is not like that he is always there so does it also suffer does he also suffer along with the soul super soul does super soul enjoy or suffer it even here on earth mm-hmm. what is the difference between the suffering in hell and the suffering here it's more intense probably that's all only a difference of degree earth is an in between stage between heaven and hell mm-hmm. mind you heaven and hell are both within the material world and the goal of life is not to go to heaven but we want to go to the spiritual world krishna's kingdom which is beyond the material world mm-hmm. most people in the world confuse heaven with the spiritual world so in heaven there is so much of celestial or heavenly material pleasure that it is hard to think of krishna in hell in the hellish planets there is so much pain and suffering it is very difficult to think of krishna and on the earth it is an in between situation neither too much suffering nor too much pleasure so the best place to go back to god it and next to vrindavan the best place to prepare for going back to god is sydney <laughs> so you can take advantage of this
because you're in a nice location, so many devotees. And just uh, connected to this one, so when a, a devotee who is perfected the, uh, Krishna consciousness, he goes back, what happens to the super soul when the soul goes back uh, or becomes a, a Swarupa? Where has the super soul, who is the super soul? The, the Lord. Yeah, Lord, but which, which form of the Lord? Uh, Shirodakshaya. Shiro Vishnu. So the super soul remains, Shirodakshaya Vishnu remains with his original form. He merges back into his original form as Shirodakshaya Vishnu who is within the universe. Mm -hmm. And the soul goes back to the spiritual world. Thank you. Any other question? Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaji. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the uh, afterlife when you talked about that when the soul gets liberated. So say if it attains the spiritual world and the spiritual world has got no concept of time. So how does the soul actually arrive like in a spiritual world? Like primarily it had some existing relationships when it was in the spiritual world, when it fell down. So how does it, when it attains its arupa, so how it actually um, happens when it arrives in the spiritual world? Well, we won't go into the question of where the soul comes from when it falls down into the material world. We won't enter into that discussion now. But suffice it to say for now, that when the soul goes to the spiritual world, the soul will get the kind of body and position, the svarup, according to consciousness, wherever, in whatever kind of relationship with Krishna, the soul will go and get an appropriate spiritual body there. Even as pure devotional service is being performed, the spiritual body is getting ready. And eventually after death, this material body is left behind and one goes in one spiritual body, back to the spiritual world. Hmm? Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, I had a question. So, if you are a sin, or at least um, if you have died without having much um, exposure to spirituality, so if you just die as a pious person or as a sinful person, Yamadutas come and take your soul. And if you die as a spiritually perfected entity, then the Vishnudutas come and take your soul. But what about the in-between case where you have done, chanted Hare Krishna for say, I don't know, five years, but you haven't come to that perfect stage, but then Yamadutas can't come and get you because Yamaraj says, said if he's chanted the name of Vishnu, I can't, you shouldn't go near them. Who takes your soul to the next Yeah, point? as I mentioned, there are certain special category of demigods, the residents of the higher planets who come and take the soul to the next destination maybe the higher planets, not the Yamadutas. Okay, yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that Antakale Jama Mevas Maran Mukta Kalevaram, that whoever thinks of me at the time of death comes to me, of this there is no doubt. And then in the Puranas, there is a verse where Narad Muni is asking Lord Narayan that if a devotee, if is not able to remember you at the time of death, what happens to him? And Lord Narayan uh, answers that if the devotee is not able to remember me, I remember him. So how do you reconcile the uh, two and the verse in the Purana? What does that mean when Lord uh, Narayan says that if he is not able to remember me at the time of death, I remember him? Does that mean the devotee goes back to Godhead? Though? It depends on whether he is fully pure or not. If the, devotee, if the devotee has become fully purified, cent percent pure, and even if the devotee, as we were discussing yesterday, dies in his sleep or something like that, then Krishna will still take the devotee back. <clears throat> but if the devotee is not perfect, <clears throat> maybe 80 percent, 90 percent, then he will still have to come back into this world. And then can, he can continue the devotional service till the stage of perfection is reached. So when the, Pura, when the Puranas say that 
the lord says that if he doesn't remember me i will remember him it means he's specifically talking about those who are already pure devotees and he will take them back to godhead even if they are not for some reason able to remember him at the time of death also another purport for that is that even if the devotee is not totally pure but if that person has been practicing krishna consciousness <clears throat> then the lord will remember him or her <clears throat> in the sense that it will ensure that it gets placed in a certain situation in the next life which will be very favorable for krishna consciousness so krishna will not forsake that jiva because that person has not become a pure devotee yet okay yes uh, hari krishna maharaj hari krishna i have two questions one relating to the soul in the plant trees and one relating to the soul in the human beings one to the soul the in one uh, soul in the plants and trees plants and, and trees one in the okay. human beings okay in case of human beings as you were just said that uh, that soul at time of death leaves the body out of nine gates and one at the health i know i know the nine, uh, nine gates so are there any visible signs as per the scriptures mention anywhere in the scriptures uh, from where we can know or a, or a learned scholar of scriptures can know <coughs> that uh, from which particular gate the soul has left in an individual body sometimes there may be subtle symptoms like that yes and there may be and secondly in the case of plants uh, when a plant is deemed to have died and the soul left its body so that as in the human being it performs the last animal functions for, for, for ceremonies so in, in plants also if we can know that this particular plant has died this particular tree has died we can perform in their car also usually that is not the practice <clears throat> to do it for lower species because some scars are there only for those in the human form of life however <clears throat> for cows and bulls who die in agoshalas they have to be buried and then devotees usually do some kirtan or if some trees unfortunately are cut for some reason unknowingly or whatever then some kirtan is done but as far as the, such sanskaras are concerned that is only for humans it is not meant for other species of life yes there is yeah okay one second yes hare krishna maharaj hare krishna uh, my question is uh, if the soul is going to the spiritual world what happens to the subtle body they get a separate subtle body or the same subtle body it goes to the spiritual world no the subtle body is a material subtle body so that gets left behind it gets left behind in the material world the elements individual elements that constitute the subtle body will merge into their respective sources within the universe but the subtle body which is material cannot enter into the spiritual world in the spiritual world only spiritual things can enter uh, because when in the subtle body they have the mind of thinking of krishna all the time is yes. it spiritualized the subtle body gets spiritualized yes it gets spiritualized but still the soul the subtle body gets left behind here but the soul has its own mind own senses the soul has its own eyes is on ears the soul is not dependent on the material mind actually speaking rather it is a material body that is dependent on the soul so the soul alone goes back goes to the spiritual world okay yes uh oh, hari krishna maharaj uh maharaj you gave two examples of um, one of cat king khatwanga khatwanga yes khatwanga who realized um, in one second uh, absolute truth and then ajamil who took 12 years after so generally speaking maharaj how long does it take for uh, perfection of sadhan bhakti when when a devotee practices it, it seriously anything from one moment to millions of years millions of years yeah. <laughs> depends on us like for example how long would it take for somebody to reach from f- f- year 1 of school to year 
or how long would it take for a university student to go from the first year of university to the graduation? Generally, all right, three years, four years, the graduation. But it may take long and longer and longer and fail one paper, do another one, prolong it five years, six years, seven years. So generally, if a, once a soul begins Krishna consciousness, success is guaranteed. It's only a question of time. <clears throat> then it may be this life, it may be the next life, it may be few lifetimes. That depends. Hmm? Yes. <clears throat> yes, you can ask, Srivas. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Uh, could you please tell us more information about the size of the soul, uh, Maharaj? Size of the soul? Yeah, when we go back to Godhead. When you go back? To <laughs> what is the size of the soul now? One by ten thousand uh, part of the tip of the head. The hair. So this is the seed. So when, you, when the soul goes to the spiritual world, it will grow into the spiritual body. Whatever be the size there, those dimensions in time and space are completely different from the dimensions we are accustomed to here. So the soul will, the soul, uh, will actually become the spiritual body. So there will be no difference between the spiritual body and the soul. Okay? I have one more question, Maharaj. Yes. Uh, is, could you tell us about the Pitru Loka? It's, it's not the planet that uh, all our Pitrus will be there. Um, could you just... They may be it? there for some time. But it's one of the planets, generally it is said it is where the uh, residence of Yamaraj is. Okay? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Where is the sound? Okay. Uh, there is a... Um, sorry Maharaj. Um, I, could, I could relate many points that you discussed today and uh, yesterday Maharaj and uh, thank you very much. Um, actually when there is a little faith uh, for the practitioner and um, he, he, there is a sense of urgency um, and there is a fear like uh, um, if we take a step towards Krishna and uh, if there is a failure like um, everybody may criticize or uh, I mean especially family or surrounding and we have been discussing about uh, this sense of urgency in terms of like uh, death can come any time and uh, giving uh, Krishna consciousness to children. So, how do we actually um, step towards Krishna when uh, there is a sense of urgency, but uh, the faith is very little and uh, there is some financial freedom? So, we have to strengthen the faith. How is that faith strengthened? By associating with those who have faith. So faith begets faith. So by coming into the association of devotees regularly, hearing the messages and pastimes and the holy names of Krishna regularly, chanting the holy names regularly, reading the scriptures, performing devotional service, taking Krishna prasadam. So doing all these things regularly, will increase our faith. Then we will understand the sense of urgency. If our hearing is going on regularly, then the sense of urgency will be there. If we miss out on hearing, then we lose our enthusiasm, we become a little casual, and we also lose the sense of urgency. <clears throat> okay? Is there any other? Like, yes. Meanwhile, I, I'll give some, I'll take these questions. <clears throat> Doing pious activities to attain heavenly planets or praying to Lord Krishna so that we don't come to earth, isn't that a desire? Doesn't that cloud your devotion? 
doing pious activities to attain heavenly planets is definitely an obstruction. And as devotees aspiring to be pure devotees, we don't want anything to do with the heavenly planets. We respect them from a distance. Namaskar. All glories to you, but we have to go. <clears throat> and as far as praying to Krishna so that we are not born again on earth, that is also a kind of material desire. <clears throat> In the sense that <clears throat> it is not <clears throat> exclusively for service of Krishna. So as we grow in our spiritual life, then we even go beyond that. Then we only want to serve Krishna for Krishna's pleasure. Should one get worried and thoughtful about this topic or should one just focus on his devotional service and leave the rest to Krishna? What do you think? Well, focus on Krishna doesn't mean that you always have to think, Oh, Yamadutas, Yamadutas, Yamadutas. <laughs> Not like that. But you focus on the topic in the sense you get the message of it. By hearing knowledge, we get faith in the scriptures. It gives us more urgency and determination to proceed on the path of Krishna consciousness. And as far as just focus on devotional service, what we are doing now is also part of focusing on devotional service. What we are doing now is not separate from devotional service. What we are doing now is we are talking about Krishna's message, we are talking about the goal of life. So both should go on. <clears throat> Is the soul confined to one body? Can the soul leave a living body and take residence in another body? It's called parakaya, parakaya pravesh. It's possible for siddhis, for yogis, advanced ashtanga yogis to do that. They can enter into another body. Ghosts can also do that, but they don't have their own gross body. So we are not much interested in that. Does the soul depart the body at the time of death or weeks, days leading to death? When does it actually leave the body? Wait, wait, this is given this side, yeah. Death is the departure of the soul from the body. So death is exactly the time at which the soul leaves the body. If the soul leaves weeks before, then how can the body survive? The body is surviving only because the soul is present in the body. Yesterday we learned that the soul comes in the form of raindrops and through grains. But that is only when you come through the heavenly planets, mind you. We thus get birth. So how can we relate this form of birth to the births which are given according to our karmas? No, coming through the grains is not a... Well, it's also kind of birth, but it's a via medium to help you to get to the human form of life. It's not exactly a birth. If a lady had quadruplets, does that mean the father ate four grains which had four souls? <laughs> Maybe one grain had four souls, who knows? <laughs> the soul is so tiny, what is the problem for one, one, four souls to accommodate in one grain? Not a problem. It can be anything. How do all the souls come down? In human beings and animals, well, the soul leaves the body and is being sent. As I said, it leaves through the lower apertures, goes to Yamaraj, comes back. And that is how it goes to the lower apertures. Why do we sing Bhakti Vinod Thakur's bhajans in the morning? It's not that. You have to sing only Bhakti Vinod Thakur's bhajans, you can sing other bhajans too. We just happen to choose these bhajans. May I request you for to sing Bol Hari Bol. There is a song called Bol Hari Bol. 
So they are asking to sing. We'll sing that if there is somebody has it on the... Somebody can search for it. Sometimes we see that Krishna ends even a great saint, the lives of even great saints and devotees in very accidental and traumatic circumstances which may discourage neophyte devotees like me. Why? Why should you be discouraged? If one is a pure devotee, then Krishna will take care in any case, whether he has a so-called tragic death or a so-called accidental death, sudden death. Krishna will take care of his pure devotees anyway, right? We just discussed that. So why should it matter? Why should we be anxious whether one is a neophyte devotee or not a neophyte devotee? It doesn't matter. How can this be perceived in Krishna conscious way? Because a person who has been an inspiration for thousands of people apparently does not even get a glorious departure after decades of devotional service. Well, glorious departure doesn't necessarily mean only that one should die in a particular physical way. It can happen in any way. Eventually the person has to go back to the spiritual world thinking of Krishna and Krishna will take care of his pure devotees. Is there any other question? Yes, somebody, yeah. Okay, you have the mic, yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, I'm sorry, I'm nervous with this. Um, if a devotee leaves a body thinking of Lord Ram, Krishna and Narayan at the same time, what happens? Where, where does she go? Very I've unlikely. also got a twin question. Good Very after. unlikely. Very unlikely to think of all at the same time. It's but it has that. happened. Well, <laughs> that's for Krishna to judge, but wherever Krishna judges, then the devotee will go to that destination. It is not for us to uh, make a judgment. Wherever that devotee's consciousness has been, accordingly the Lord will take the soul to that destination. So, if one is not a pure devotee, one will not go to the spiritual world. Cent percent pure devotion is required. And then after that, depending on what we are actually thinking of at the time of death, then Krishna will decide. It is not for us to say. Right? Same. Aren't we as devotees not to think about going back to Godhead but rather ask the God, the Lord, Krishna, how do I serve you further? Where do you want to send me? Yes. So, of course, it's not wrong to ask to go back to Godhead because in back to Godhead you'll be serving Krishna. You're not going for some other purpose. At the same time, the devotee also understands that if Krishna wants to keep me here, so be it. We are happy to serve you, Krishna, wherever you want us to be. That's the mentality or the attitude of the devotee. Okay? In case one does not attain perfection and has to go to the heavenly planets, causing distraction, how can one act in a manner that one comes back to earthly planets to continue the devotional life towards perfection? and not get distracted going to heavenly planets. So that's the risk. So better not go to the heavenly planets. Better go back to God at the end of this life. So better do our Krishna consciousness very, very seriously in this life. What should devotees do for, their, for the life support systems of their relatives? It depends. If medically they declare that there is no hope and it will just go on and on and on for years and years and years and that person is living just like a vegetable in the sense under a state of unconsciousness, in a coma, just merely technically alive, then what is the point in living? There is no point in living like that. So then might as well 
just uh, call off. It does happen like that. However, if there is some chance, then you may keep it for a while. Have you all heard of Walt Disney? Walt Disney. He wanted to be immortal. So then he asked that his body be preserved in, in a certain way. And so the idea was that He said, when science advances to the extent that it will be able to bring back my body to life, let my body be maintained. So he had faith that science would come to the point where dead people could be brought back to life. So he wanted the body preserved. So that was his will. And he had the money. So then his body was preserved. And then a huge thing came out in the, amongst the relatives. What about the inheritance? <laughs> Get it now? Or what if he comes alive later after some time? If science progresses and again he comes back. Finally it was leading to so much confusion and chaos. They said, finally just pull out the plug. Of course he was already dead at that time. But So for terminally ill patients it depends. In very, very serious comatose cases like that. We may sometimes take a call because there is no point living a life like that as a vegetable. And at least in some countries, the government takes the burden financially. But in other countries, the, the family is just financially wiped out in trying to take care of some patient like that. It's just impossible, they cannot do it. Where it may cost a huge amount every day for the ventilator support or something like that. At least even then they can try to do their best if there is some hope for survival. But if there is no hope, then there is no point really. Srimad Bhagavatam explains that when Bhishma passed away, his soul merged into Lord Krishna. Bhishma is one of the Mahajans, but how can he be merged just like the Mayavadis merge? Please explain. No, Bhishma doesn't merge. Eventually, he yes, goes back to Vaikuntaloka. Just like Shishupal also, everyone saw his soul merging into Krishna's body. But then he went on and resumed his position as Jaya and Vijay. So even for Bhishma, he of course is, is a pure devotee in the Vaikuntha Bhav. So he goes back to Vaikuntha and becomes a great devotee in Vaikuntha. Okay? So alright, one last two or three, how many? Okay, three, four. Okay, last four questions. So we'll, those who have raised their hands now, we stop it. One, two, three, four. Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, I've heard that uh, there is an abode for Lord Shiva in the spiritual world. Uh, and those who worship Lord Shiva in his personal form reach that abode. How is that we are having uh, two infinities? And how is that those who don't do samskaras for Lord Vishnu enter the spiritual world. Thank you. Lord Shiva's abode is not exactly the spiritual world and it is not the material world also. It is a place that is in between. It's an intermediate position. Kailash. That is in between. That's a special category. Lord Shiva is a very interesting personality. And his abode is also very interesting. In between. Next question was, yes. Um, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, I was just a bit intrigued. You know, in, in Hindu religion, they always say that if you have a son, then, um, you know, during the last rites, Shraddha, you know, the soul reaches liberation. Is it true? Not that the soul reaches liberation, but the putra, as I mentioned earlier, when the putra performs the Shraddha, the word putra comes from pu and trayate. Trayate means to deliver from. And pu is a, pun is the name of a hellish planet. So the putra can deliver the descendants, or rather the ancestors, from the hellish planet. Therefore he is called a putra. 
But it's not that the parents will be or the ancestors will be liberated from the cycle of birth and death by doing Shraddha. They will be liberated from hell if they are in hell for some reason. And if they are not in hell also, they will get some other form of material relief. They will not get spiritual relief. Spiritual relief will come only when a devotee performs Shraddha and in a Krishna conscious way. Where Krishna Prasadam is offered to the ancestors, the devotees come and do Kirtan and so on for the departed soul and so on. Okay? Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, you briefly touched upon violent deaths like suicide or murder in course of this discourse and um, you also said that the soul then moves around as a ghost if it's a violent death. But isn't everything in human life predestined? I mean, even suicide, isn't that predestined? So, well, we are misusing the gift of our free will and that is a punishment for it. So the problem is the misuse of free will. It's because of a certain consciousness that has come about because of some sinful activity we have done. It gets compounded further. Mm -hmm. So therefore at any cost suicide is never to be done. However much one may be suffering in this world because that only aggravates the problem later on. Hmm? Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, my question is, uh, if one remembers at the time of death one's guru, will that lead to liberation? Depends. Attachment to the pure devotees, to great acharyas, is definitely very helpful. At the same time, the instruction is for us to remember Krishna. Yes. That is the crux. So the Guru's job is to help us to remember Krishna. So we have to train ourselves to think of Krishna at the time of death. Of course, remembering devotees is also very auspicious, definitely, it's very beneficial. But ultimately, it's, we have to remember Krishna. Thank you. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, in the 16th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna initially describes the demoniac qualities people have and then he later on says that asurim yonim apanna muda janmani janmani that he casts them into lower and lower species of life, life after life and they can never approach him and then slowly they sink to the lower level of, lowest level of existence. So then what is the hope because even uh, these days we find I think more than devotees we find lots of people who are totally disinterested in any kind of religion or spiritual practices. So what is the hope for then these kinds of people or species? This is the hope, the devotees. We create their Sukriti, go and chant Harinam, Sankirtan on the streets, give them some prasadam, preach to them a little bit, talk about Krishna, just give a book to them, Somehow or the other, get them to even say Krishna's name once. Even one time saying Krishna's name, then they are protected. Then it will take millions of lives maybe. But then another name of Krishna, another name, another name, another name, building, 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 building up like that over a long, long time. Eventually he will become a devotee. So then Krishna is leaving it to the devotees to go and deliver everyone. Right? Okay, so we will have one song now at your request.
Hare Krishna. Bol Hari Bol, Bol Hari Bol, Bol Hari Bol. Monero Anande Bhai Bol Hari Bol Bol Hari Bol Bol Hari Bol Bol Hari Bol Janame Janame Sukhe Bol Hari Bol Janame Janame Sukhe Bol Hari Bol Bol Hari Bol Bol Hari Bol Bol Hari Bol Manav Janama Pe Bhai Bol Hari Bol Manav Janma Pe Bhai Bol Hari Bol Bol Hari Bol Bol Hari Bol Bol Hari Bol Sukhe thako, dukhe thako, bol hari bol Sukhe thako, dukhe thako, bol hari bol Bol hari bol, bol hari bol, bol hari bol Sampade vipade bhai bol hari bol Sampade vipade bhai bol hari bol Bol hari bol bol hari bol bol hari bol Vihe thako vane thako bol hari bol Grihe thako vane thako bol hari bol Bol hari bol bol hari bol bol hari bol Krishna ra sansara thake bol hari bol Krishna ra sansara thake bol hari bol bol hari bol bol hari bol bol hari bol Asat Sangha Chhari Bhai Bol Hari Bol Asat Sangha Chhari Bhai Bol Hari Bol Bo 
बोल हरि बोल बोल हरि बोल बोल हरि बोल वैष्णव चरण पड़े बोल हरि बोल वैष्णव चरण पड़े बोल हरि बोल बोल हरि बोल बोल हरि बोल बोल हरि बोल गौर नित्यानंद 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 बोल बोल हरि बोल बोल हरि बोल बोल हरि बोल गौर गदाधर 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 बोल बोल हरि बोल बोल हरि बोल बोल हरि बोल गौर अद्वैत 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 बोल बोल हरि 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 बोल हरि बोल 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 Yes. So how about having some kirtan for ten fifteen minutes? Yes. So we'll get down and we must begin and conclude by kirtan. We had little kirtan, so we'll have more kirtan now for about fifteen minutes. Agreed? Any disagreements? Okay. Hare Krishna.
हरे कृष्णा सोए